ladies and gentlemen, doesn't work, does it? Put it a bit higher. Testing, testing. She puts it on. There we are. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second week of summer school for those of you who haven't been to the first, even. But we're delighted to see this great full house for Suzanne's course and to welcome her again to summer school. Um, she is uh, known to many of you, but I think the Silk Road is the sort of acme of her, her, her huge audience here, and I think you're going to have a very, very interesting three lectures. And I would like to remind you that there will be a fourth optional session, um, but we'll be able to tell you in which room that is later on. And also, Su Suzanne has very kindly said she will introduce the films on the Silk Road. Uh, and again, I'm afraid there'll be a full house there at one o'clock on Wednesday. But I'd like to say something about Suzanne herself now, uh, very briefly. And um, she has degrees from Chelsea School of Art and Exeter College of Art in Fine Art. She founded Japan Interlink herself in 1995, so that's almost 25 years ago that it's been in London um, a very powerful uh, instrument, really, for the spread of Japanese culture, and in, she has been uh, instrumental in getting it into many uh, schools, universities, and colleges. In addition to that, um, she published a book in uh, 2016, and the Bridges, called Bridges, and that is between uh, the, the cultural links between Japan and the UK. And she's also at the present working on a book on the craftsmen of Kyoto. She lectures at the uh, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, also at the British Museum, and uh, for the Arts Council. So. Um, she also lectures in Australia and uh, in numerous uh, parts of South Africa when she comes on a visit. And uh, we would like to welcome her very heartily, and uh, we're very, very pleased that she's here. I've known her over many years. Yeah. Thanks. Now, if I can get myself unhooked from this. Hello? Um, two minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Terrell, for that very nice introduction. And thank you all for being here today. It's a great pleasure to be in Cape Town again. Wonderful weather, wonderful people. It's great to be here. So I'm doing a, a presentation um, on the Silk Road past, present, and future. Some of you may have been to my lectures on the Silk Road before, so some of it will be familiar, other parts may be not so familiar. Can you, can you hear me? Is this all right in the back row? Jolly good. Um, about the, the fourth session maybe on Thursday, which we're hoping to have a room booked for the same time slot, 3 p.m., this is completely optional and is really um, a kind of open session for discussion. There will be little time, if any, for Q&A during the next three sessions because we have a lot to get through. So I thought if some of the issues raised by this course might be of interest to people, they might like to come along and maybe discuss them. Completely up to you, completely optional. You, you don't have to pay for it. Right? So we'll see how we go. So if we could have the lights down, please. Um, so the three, there's a lot of streams I've been looking at and researching to do with the Silk Road over the last several years. Um, and to do with the peoples and the travels 
what um, the ancient Silk Road is of greatest interest to me, but of course there are very new developments um, which I've been reading about. And the things that have been occurring to me along this, these strands of Silk Roads is the aspects of cultural heritage. How do people keep their cultural heritage? Where is it held? How is it held? How did people travel? Where did they stay? Where was the water supply? What happened at different times during the long centuries of all this great story? So there are, there are different strands which are coming through um, for looking at, and we'll be highlighting and spotlighting uh, certain of these places. Now, um, two years ago today, 14th of January, the first East Wind freight train came through into the freight station terminus in Barking in East London, all the way from Yi Wu, which is on the east coast of China. It took 16 days for this train to make the journey right across the Silk Road routes, which would have taken months, if not years, in ages gone by. This is part of the new Silk Road, which is being orchestrated by China, and we will be looking at aspects of that primarily in the third session on Wednesday. So this is past, present, and future. This is part of the future, and um, we'll see how that is transpiring. As you well know, it's not just one road. It is a myriad of roads and tributaries that connect the various places from east to west. And one of the problems with the Silk Road, as a, as a, for, for the historian's point of view, is the number of routes that people took. They're rather like river tributaries, the natural routes. They kept changing because of circumstances, because of natural disasters or warfare. So these routes, there were main routes to be sure, but they also opened up and closed down at different times throughout the centuries. And we're talking primarily first century onwards, even second century BC there were traders. Of course it goes right back 2,000 years. So where we have what I call the central region here, and it's easy to locate this central region because um, it's difficult to point from here. We have the Taklamakan Desert, which is right in the middle. Now this is the middle, this is in the western part of present-day China, and the early routes would circumnavigate to the north or the south of the Taklamakan Desert, which was an incredibly um, hostile place. Uh, Taklamakan means if you go in, you don't come out. So people <laughs> tended to avoid going through the Taklamakan and went around it. So in all the maps, and there are many versions of the Silk, Road, m Silk Roads maps, you can see the central region here going above or below the Taklamakan Desert. This, of course, is the Tibetan Empire and mountains bordered by mountains on both sides. So then we go west into here, into the um, Arab Caliphates. So there are many different routes taking us along these different journeys. So some of these are here, and uh, this is... Again, this region, but stretching further into the west, there's Constantinople, as you know, Byzantium, present-day Istanbul is over here, and here is our Taklamakan Desert here, and it goes through to uh, Xi'an, uh, which was Chang'an, the great Chinese city of Tang Dynasty, China. We'll be seeing more of that as we go along. But also, there is this map, which is a very interesting map, and this is showing us the transmission of Buddhism from India. As you know, Buddhism arose in the 6th century BC. Um, I, I'm still a BC AD person rather than CE and BCE. It doesn't roll off for me, so it, excuse me if I'm using the old uh, words for this. So Buddhism arose and came up north and joined these routes, the trade routes. Buddhism was rather like Christianity in that it was a civilizing force. 
which was taken up by many different peoples. So it came up along these trade routes, went all through here, down across China, down into Korea, and eventually into Japan. Japan is the natural terminus, the eastern terminus of the Silk Roads. It's often left off the maps, but that is where a lot of things ended up, as we will see later on. So it took from the 6th century BC to the 6th century AD, or, B, or CE, Christian era, took a thousand years or more for Buddhism to trans transfer through China right through to Japan by Korea. So, and all this was in the trade routes which were already established in the early centuries, um, with sort of second century BC, certainly the first century AD, as we will see from the artifacts which are being found. Now, a lot of the research on these northern and southern routes around the Taklamakan were done by uh, Sir Oral Stein. So Mark Orlstein, who was a Hungarian um, archaeologist and in Indologist, in fact, India was his main subject, not China, um, and he had been doing archaeological research in Iran and other areas in Central Asia and was then asked by the National Geographic Society to do some expeditions and excavations on the silk routes north and south of the Taklamakan Desert which he was doing. So he made several of these trips between 1900 and 1915. His dates, as you can see, 1862 to 1943. He made many, many trips. He kept meticulous notes uh, wherever he was. Uh, he wrote over 20 books. He was extremely erudite and very productive in the results of his researches and archaeological expeditions. Um, so he made four major expeditions to the eastern Silk Road area, north and south of the Taklamakan Desert. So all of that then went back to the National Geographic Society and then the Natural History Museum, and we have the, the results of his researches <clears throat> and images and things which we know much more about these peoples. Now, Mark Orlstein was an, was an interesting archaeologist. He was not in fact interested in discovering treasure in the manner of Howard Carter's discoveries of Tutankhamun's tomb, he was much more interested in discovering the lifestyles of the peoples of the area and the everyday culture of peoples in these remote regions. And that was his interest. And that's what he recorded and uh, wrote about in, uh, extensively. So um, he was a very interesting man and we've gained a lot of um, knowledge from him. I like him also because, as you can see on the left-hand photograph of him, he was short, stocky, he walked a lot and was transported by donkey and yak and had his faithful dog Dash with him on these expeditions. They obviously didn't need doggy passports in those days. He would just take the dog wherever he went. So he was an intrepid explorer and uh, quite a, a very strong character. He's a very interesting man. Now, the, the mountains in this region, and they still are there, of course, mountains. Tian Shan means heavenly mountains, uh, bordering the northern uh, trade routes around the northern side of the Taklamakan Desert. So it is a remote region, and it was traveling in those times was extremely difficult and dangerous. There were all kinds of um, different peoples there bandits, slavers, all kinds of people. So it was a difficult and dangerous journey. These mountains, the Flame Mountains, um, also in that region, are banded with striations of different color, as you can see, the different strata of minerals, uh, which are of great <clears throat> importance these days for mining. So going along these areas, and we're looking at the western region um, of China at the moment, where the Taklamakan is, we're looking at Turfan, Kashgar, Xinjiang is the western region of present-day China, and uh, these long straight roads um, have been now supplanted by railways, so we'll see how that has been changing over the last few years. There are still remote regions where outside uh, Kashgar there's this Hanoi stupa of the 7th century, Buddhist stupa, one of the markers. As you know, a stupa is the marking, one of the sites of Buddhism, 
And <clears throat> when the Buddha died, his, apparently his remains, after being cremated, were divided up into eight portions to mark the eightfold path of Buddhism and were sent out in eight directions. Uh, and at, at, at an auspicious place, they were um, stopped and built a stupa or what we call a pagoda, to mark the place of the Buddha, rather like a church spire in that way, or a tower dedicated to Buddhism so that the Buddhist pilgrims on those routes would be able to see it and perhaps stop and go and worship. So this is an extraordinary monument, much eroded, but still standing from the 7th century. Now along these routes, many and various, there were big cities. It's hard to imagine now with these archaeological sites what was going on, and some places were uh, fairly remote, but they had quite substantial cities, and this is an interesting one as a sort of study to have a look at. It's called Zhaohe, <coughs> Zhaohe site in Yarkoto, uh, which was a Turkic, Uyghur Turkic kingdom in those days. So, and it was established around the second century BCE and went on until the Yuan dynasty around the 14th century CE or AD. So it was, a, it was effectively a large city for about 1500 years. And it was quite a large site. Um, it was uh, on a plateau um, raised up. It had three gateways to the west, south and east and uh, was very well organized. The, south, the southern side was residential and official, and there are um, areas where they've excavated where they found rows of buildings that would have been either official or residences. The western side was dedicated to Buddhist um, monuments and stupas. Um, the north was a cemetery, where people were buried, and the eastern side was to do with trade and um, uh, trade and sort of what else can I say? Business, <laughs> residential, religious, business and trade cemetery. Very well organised, very well defined. <clears throat> And this was a city, this is one of the Buddhist um, stupas, uh, quite a big temple on the left, and the ramparts to the city on the right <coughs> hand side there, there's a very small person right at the top there, so you can see how high this is looking over into the distance. <coughs> this is quite impressive. And this was a, a city of around 200,000 people at the time that was well organized well traded and uh, well known at the time. So this was quite substantial. So people would, on these routes, would have certainly stopped in these kinds of cities. And in that time, most of the cities in this region would have been walled cities, like they were. This is a Chinese uh, hand scroll called the Qingling Hand Scroll of the 10th century. But it shows us quite a good example of a typical walled city of this time, and with um, towers and turrets up here, big structures, looking out, protecting like a fortress, fortress cities. This was, this was common. So when the caravans and the peoples were traveling along these routes, they would need papers and documents. And when they arrived at one of these cities, they would have to camp outside the city walls, and the leader of the caravan sarai, or the caravan, would have to go in with the papers, lodge with the officials, and say what they were coming in for, what they were trading, what they hoped to do, where they were going to stay. It was all very organized, and they had to pay taxes and tolls as well to go into and out of the city-states or to cross borders or to cross bridges. So there was an effective system of travel with taxes that evolved over the centuries, and certainly around 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, this was well in place by then. So um, there were ways to go about this. Now, this is uh, present-day Xi'an, which was old Chang'an in uh, the, pre the former capital of China. This is one of the city walls with one of those towers, 
The wall itself is, is huge. I mean, they have bus rides, as you can see, bus rides along the wall to take you all around. They're so huge. And they have uh, ceremonies and processions that go on the wall. We all know about the Great Wall of China. Well, they had walls everywhere around the city, so they were very good at building them. So this is a, a big structure, one of the four, because you would have four directions and four gateways, right? North, south, east, and west. So they were very organized in that way. Outside of the city walls, it was bleak and difficult and barren and hostile, basically. They still have Bactrians roaming freely in certain parts of these areas. The Bactrians, of course, are the double-humped camels. The dromedaries are the one with one hump. Uh, so they're still out there. And this is a, a lovely tribute scroll <coughs> with inscriptions below. Uh, double-sided around about the 9th century, showing us um, Bactrian camel and uh, caparisoned horse being led by two, two attendants there. The reason it looks a bit strange is that on the back of this paper, there was another piece of paper pasted onto it. And on that was written in Chinese um, the kinds of repairs that were needed to a certain building in one of the towns. So it's almost as if it's like a double-sided post-it note. Somebody was writing notes to themselves about what they needed to do and the materials required for certain repairs. And on the other side, somebody had drawn these rather lovely and fluid horse and camel of the caravans of the Silk Road. So it's a, a rather nice fragment of the peoples of that time. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this map of the Chinese Empire during the Tang Dynasty. Tang Dynasty was 618 to 907, right? And this was one of the great um, empires of the Chinese, one of their least xenophobic periods where they openly embraced other cultures to come in and through, and it was a very interesting time in China. So we have, sorry, I have to come out here. Chang'an was the great capital city of Tang Dynasty China here, right in the middle. Uh, present day Xi'an, same place. Uh, easily located with the Huang Ho, which is the Yellow River, which comes up like here in a square and goes through. So you've got the northern river of the Huang Ho, and you've got the Yangtze, which comes down here. So you've got the two main big rivers of China, along which very early settlements and pottery cultures grew up along the rivers, the north, the Huang Ho, and the Yangtze. So already there was a lot of indigenous peoples in this area, and of course China being one of the oldest, um, longest settlements everywhere. But it's interesting to see this bit here is their extension into the west at that time, and this was called the Gansu Corridor, which meant they were going west and for trade, and going towards the west. And there were a lot of incursions. It's why they started to build the wall in the uh, second century, was to keep people in or out. So you've got the Kitan, uh, you've also got the Jershan, Jershan Chin, the Eastern Turks, the Shatu, and the Uyghurs. There were all different Turkic peoples and nomads and uh, tribes and clans to the north which made incursions in and out into trying to get into China. So that's one of the reasons they started building the Great Wall, was to keep them out, basically. But the Uyghurs have been around a, lo a, a long time. The Western Turks were here. And over here, you've got uh, Fan, you've got all the stands, Kazakhstan, um, <clears throat> Afghanistan, all the stands, Uzbekistan, they're all there in that grouping to the west. So during the Han Dynasty, Han was two, 200 BC to 200 AD. Um, again, it was a big empire, and when the Chinese had a, a consolidated empire like the Han, or particularly the, the Tang, they would then have a strong military that would then protect peoples going out to the west, always looking for more territory. So this was also consonant with the early Silk Road traders and routes in the early centuries, 1st, 2nd century BC, AD, coming into that period and those early centuries. And this is uh, where the 
routes were beginning to open up between China and uh, what they called the West. <laughs> we call it the East, they call it the West. It depends where you are along the routes as to what is East and what is West. So Tang Dynasty was one of its great uh, dynasties, and of course we have a lot of evidence for this from the tomb cultures uh, that grew up. So these wonderful sand sites, sand site means three color sand, three, three color glaze, pottery, low-fired objects that were put into the tombs, guardians, camels, people, horses. This is a Tartar horseman. He would have had a conch shell as a horn riding. Um, superb examples of these um, items which were made to be um, never seen, of course, because they were made in great quantities to put into the tombs, which were not supposed to be disturbed or ransacked. Um, just as well they were, so that we can see them. Um, but of course they were, they were not for public consumption, but they are wonderful items, and the energy comes through. Other guardians, uh, two officials, which I like very much, um, these are in the British Museum collection. This is a, a Chinese official who looks quite obsequious, doesn't he? Um, and he's got a bird motif on his cap, which would denote a certain rank in his area of officialdom. They would have badges of rank with different birds and different animals on them. Of course, the dragon was the top one for the emperor, but other lower ranks had different birds. So he's got a bird on his cap here. And this wonderful chap with a beard, slightly portly, might have been a Sogdian, because the Sogdian peoples were very good at trade. They were good merchants. They controlled a lot of the trading routes in the Western regions. Um, and, this, and they were famed for having good hair growth and beards. Well, this one certainly has a fine beard. Uh, it's not stated whether he was or wasn't, but it, it seems he could well be um, a portrait of a Sogdian merchant official at that time. The one on the right over here is um, a foreign storyteller. Um, he's got a hat on, he's got Western features, he's certainly not Han Chinese, and um, he's, this image here is like a, a sort of cloud or a balloon with a, a Buddha figure in it. So he's telling stories about the Buddha or the Buddha's sutras. And he's walking, he's got leopard skins on, and um, he's accompanied by what looks like a tiger, uh, probably not in actuality, maybe it's one of his stories. But he's an itinerant storyteller, um, singing and going around people, telling them the stories perhaps of Buddha and Buddha's life. So it's an interesting image that's one of these very mixed peoples and the foreign peoples that were uh, going along these different trade routes in these central regions. Also, these city-states, many of the city-states and places produced their own coins. Nothing was regulated, everything was fluid. So you could produce what you liked. So there's imitation Byzantine coins up here, you can see with sort of imitation Byzantine heads on them. And then there are the sino kushan the sort of more Chinese coins which are up here. Uh, with her, the square hole in the middle. The holes were so that you could put them all on a, a cord, a long cord, and then count them, rather like a rosary beads, but you would put your money on a long string, and then certain lengths of string would be so much money which you would hand over, which is why they had the holes in, and then a whole collection of them down the side there. So every, and if you're into coins, it's a huge area to research because, of course, they're all different from different regions and different times and quite a fascinating study just from the coins alone. Never mind the silk of the silk roots and trade. And, of course, the Chinese had invented sericulture with the silkworm cocoons and the spinning and the making of all this stuff and held it their closely guarded secret for many, um, for as long as they could, basically, to corner the market. But these coming from tombs, uh, first century sash here, woven, quite loosely woven silk, and woven sleeves from the second century in the Tarim Basin. Tarim Basin is one of the lowest points 
for altitude, and it's very dry. So the tombs that, are, were, that were made in the Tarim region, it's like the, there's no moisture there, so things don't rot, they stay. So these extraordinary sleeves, and the ladies of the time in, in China and these regions would have different sleeves uh, with their dresses, different patterns. I've been told by weavers in Japan, silk weavers, that sleeves like this are so finely woven, people cannot weave like this now and have not been able to weave this finely for a long time because we've lost our sensitivity. We can't feel the cloth, we don't have the detail, we don't have the sensitivity. And I thought that was a very interesting thing about cloth and weaving and the ancient fabrics which are housed in some of the uh, great museums in China and also in Japan. The fabric is so fine, it's falling apart, it's so thin. How can you weave something so thin? And they've told me, you can't do it. People have lost the art of weaving that kind of material today. It's gone, it's lost. So these fragments um, and their stories are, are really very revealing. Other silk, uh, there's a silk pennant here, like a flag. And what's interesting here is the roundels. Uh, this was uh, around 7th century, again, Tang Dynasty period. And uh, the roundels, the flower roundels, are quite ubiquitous along silk routes, and particularly in China and Japan. The old um, patterns of cloth often had roundels like this in them. You see it everywhere. Uh, another silk, finely woven silk sash. And look at this, a piece of tie-dye. This is wonderful, 7th century. You know you fold a piece of cloth into four and you dip the edges. This is what you get. <laughs> they were doing it even then. So it's very nice. Three very different types of cloth and weaving uh, for silk and dyeing. Um, very, um, quite extraordinary. Now also from the tombs, woven silk slippers from Turfan, 8th century. There are three different types of woven silk um, this white one is the outer one here with birds and flowers on it. There's an inner one, it's probably a bit difficult to see on this slide, but it's got stripes, different coloured stripes, almost like candy stripes on the inside. And there's another different section at the back, which is a different cloth as well, with a, um, a sort of woven insole here. Exactly what this lady is wearing here, right at the bottom of her silk dress. She's a Sansai pottery court lady playing the cymbals, musician, and that, those are the shoes, the turn-ups here. She's wearing exactly the same kind of slippers as we're showing here, which is really rather lovely. So, China, <coughs> Bai Ma Su, <coughs> which means white, white Horse Temple, circa 65 AD. This is where the first transmission of Buddhism was really um, started in China. So 6th century BC, Ch uh, Buddhism arose, and in the intervening centuries, um, emissaries from China went to the west, to, and they encountered two um, Indian monks. And they brought these two Indian monks back into China and located them at this site, not actually with this building, this has been rebuilt, but in the first century AD, they located them at this site. They called it White Horse Temple. Apparently, they came on a white horse. I don't know if that's true, but that's the story. Fair enough. And they started to transcribe the texts from Sanskrit, and the other monks would then transcribe them into Chinese and this was the first dissemination point for Buddhism in China which then because of that spread through to Korea the bridge between China and Japan and eventually into Japan so this was an important point for the dissemination of Buddhism in China so the texts themselves are mostly now in Chinese and, of course, people learnt to speak and read and write Chinese, and the Buddhist texts are often on this beautiful indigo blue uh, paper in gold and silver. And you had images of various Buddhas 
um, in, with the coming to earth, coming down to the world in clouds with apsaras and attendants with them. So they're very beautiful images. So as I'm saying, the, <clears throat> the advent of Buddhism was rather like Christianity. In the West, it was a civilizing force. It gave doctrines, it gave images, it gave worship, it gave study, and it gave education to people, which transcribed and was transmitted through these countries. And there were manuals that um, prescribed how to... Uh, show the different types of Buddhas. This was part of the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism, which is called the Greater Vehicle, in which there are many different sects. There's the Lotus Sect, the Diamond Sutra. There are many different canons of Buddhism in the Mahayana tradition. The Hinayana tradition was more pure, was more simple, was more focused, and went south into Burma and Thailand. But the Mahayana traveled the trade routes along the Silk Road. So there are many different types and sects of Buddhism along the way. And they had their traditions. These are the mudras, the different hand positions of the Buddhas, um, seating them with water, with fire, with different ways. So this is how they learnt, and this is how they disseminated the teachings and writings of Buddhism with manuscripts like these. So within a few hundred years, 366, roughly, Yung Kang and many other Buddhist sites were being made in China. You can see this is a large Buddha. There's a little person standing there. And you can see these big cave sites were dedicated to these huge images of Buddhas and their attendants, the Bodhisattva, which is standing there beside. The Bodhisattva is a being rather like a saint, who has achieved enlightenment, but puts off going into nirvana to come back to earth to help us mortals. They are benevolent beings. They are, they are the antecessors between us and the Buddhist universe and Buddha. So they are helpful beings and much revered and much worshipped. So these cave sites began to be made. Um, India, of course, has a huge tradition of cave carving, both for Hinduism and Buddhism. Could do lots of lectures on that, but um, we are skipping India at the moment and going straight into China. So they followed the tradition of Buddhist cave sites and created several of them. So going into the regions from China into the West, um, this is part of that western Gansu corridor that you saw as being part of their borders and the western outpost of Yangguan Pass. So beyond this point was the Wild West, as the Chinese would have called it, uncharted territory. You're on your own, you know, sort of good luck to you. Um, this side of it, we can organize you and control and protect you, but after that, very difficult. And the routes are still rather difficult to negotiate, even in present times. They were building huge passes. This is a Toyuk Gorge. This is in the western regions. And along these western regions, this is on the northern route over the Taklamakan, there are still evidences of some of the many, many Buddhist cave sites carved into the sides of hills along this route. So people would stop and go into these cave sites for refuge. And some of them um, are still there. Some of them you can still go in. Some of them are restricted and you cannot go in. This one at Kizil, Buddhist cave sites, around about the 6th century, still has its original murals on the wall. And there is something rather familiar with this, is there not? This kind of arrangement of a central Buddha with auras and his attendants and bodhisattvas and guardians. It looks rather like a centralized Christian iconography with halos and Christian saints, doesn't it? There's a very interesting thing about halos. Where did they originate? Are they Christian or are they Buddhist? It's an emanation from the back of the head, apparently, from when one reaches enlightenment. But the very early Christian cultures didn't have them, but Buddhism had them, so, and they played off each other. It's a very interesting area to look at. Also in these sites, um, the walls and the ceilings would have been painted and gilded. 
And we're also looking at the damage, because as people came, um, <clears throat> not particularly Orlstein, but there were many other explorers who found these caves and decided to take back souvenirs. So we've got the damage here of images of saints which have been hacked off the wall. You can see clearly a great big chunk has been taken off here and down here. And the gold was scraped off so that they could retrieve the gold. Many of these sites, of course, were abandoned for centuries, and nobody cared about them. So nobody cared if you went in and took stuff off the walls. It was common practice. And we'll see more of that as we go on. And also with the advent of the Islamic faith, they would go into the caves and desecrate some of those images as well. So there's been a fair significant amount of damage to these places. Now I'm showing, the, showing you the Sanchi Stupa, one of the, the, the great stupa of Sanchi in the Ashoka period built by Emperor Ashoka, who embraced Buddhism in the same way that Alexander uh, embraced Christianity. And it was the biggest stupa um, and temple to Buddhism at the time, and is still one of the biggest, 232 BCE. This is an early, early date for Buddhism. It's a huge temple and has four gates to it, north, south, east, and west. And we are looking at the structure of the gates, which we'll see again later on. Can you see there are three bands, like three bridges across the top here? and you circumnavigate this. So you go into the inner courtyard and you walk around the stupa. It's a huge stupa, one of the most important sites in the world, not just for Buddhism, but for world religions, is Sanchi. So, Sanchi is actually located around about here in the sort of central top part of India as part of the Ashoka Empire. Lots we could say about that. But this chap, Zhuang Zhang, travels to the west from Xi'an, the capital of China, Chang'an at the time, which is, Xi'an is here. There's the Huang Ho River, right, the Yellow River going up there. Now, he was a Buddhist monk. Chang'an, the Tang Dynasty, 652, um, A.D. C.E. He was um, given a commission, if you like, to go to the West to gain new scrolls and new sutras of the Buddhist religion. So he went out and walked through all these places here. He went to Ajanta, Ajanta was a huge Buddhist cave site, which I would love to talk about, but uh, we don't really have the time. And he went all around here and here. And all this, he's got a wonderful backpack on him for the seventh century, all this. Look at all the scrolls. He brought all the scrolls back with the sutras and the writings and the images stacked up in his backpack here with his sandals and his leggings to keep him warm and his whisk to take the flies off, and a little light hanging from this canopy here to keep him dry and to light his way. I mean, it's the most wonderful image of a pilgrim. This is the ultimate pilgrim. And Zhuang Zhan is well known for this epic journey, which took him about seven years. He was about 27 when he made this trip, so at least he was young and fit. And by the time he got back to Chang'an after doing all of this, he spent the rest of his life writing up and translating the sutras that he'd got on his epic journey. You might know this epic journey as the Tales of Monkey, um, which was popularized on TV and in Chinese culture. So uh, the Tales of Monkey are actually based on this particular pilgrim and his epic journey. It's quite amazing. And he went to the Buddhist sites, and I'll show you this place here, which we will look at here. At the beginning of the Taklamakan split is Danhuang, another big, very important site, which is here. Danhuang was a, a garrison town um, 
at the split point between whether you go north or south around the Taklamakan Desert. And um, it was a very important site. It was a Buddhist site. And uh, it was uh, called the Mogao Grottoes, which means a cave of a thousand Buddhas. <clears throat> and it was also called the Flaming Beacon. And there is a beacon up here, as you can see, also. This section is one side of this big mountainside here. And this section was the residential caves for the monks and for the pilgrims and travelers and visitors. So you would, before you went north or south, you would stop here and you would rest and you would replenish yourself at this site and um, they would help you. This is looking uh, across the top. You can see how remote this is and how difficult the terrain was. This was difficult journeying by any standards. And we're looking across the top here of the other side, the western side, which houses a loft. They call it a loft. It's actually been built out. But inside this loft, there is this huge Vairokana Buddha that was carved into the side of the mountain, like the one we saw earlier at Yang Kang. Right? This is a huge image, enormous image, and um, very impressive. They've covered it over. It was, would have been open to the elements, but they've covered it to protect it. But you can see there are windows. So around about here, perhaps there or there, you have to allow the gaze of Buddha out into the world. You cannot impede or block off the gaze of the Buddha. So if he is enclosed in a temple structure or something, there will be a gap, there will be a window where he can look out into the world. Very important. So this is impressive by any means. This is 8th century. <clears throat> the first caves were cut here around 366, about the same time as the Yang Kang um, uh, cave site as well. And in that side, on, along that side, there were hundreds of open cave sites and grottos, which is why it's called grottos of the 1,000 Buddhas, with, with effigies like this. Now, these photographs were taken around about the 1970s, I would think, when they were still open. Since then, they've built up, they've built them in and enclosed them to help protect them, but also to stop the looting, because a lot of these, of course, are empty. And the looting, much like the looting of any tombs anywhere in the world, um, has been consistent. So there were thousands and thousands of images which have all gone over the centuries and been looted, but some of them still remain. And some of the finds, particularly by Oral Stein, were things like this beautiful stucco head, a Buddha head, absolutely beautiful, painted. And this is uh, another one on the right there, uh, found at Mez Einak, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. So many finds. Now, during this time, during these centuries, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century, Tang Dynasty, thousands of these images of Buddha, portable images, uh, would have been made in bronze, gilt bronze, wood, um, all sorts of things carried and transmitted. This is a bodhisattva, Guan Yin. This is um, uh, a beautiful apsara, a bit like an angel, who is playing a, a biwa or a pipa, Beautiful. So the, these were made <coughs> throughout the region um, and <coughs> disseminated and passed on and also traded as well. This is all part of the trade. So Mark Oral Stein, as I said, did four main expeditions around here and he, went, he discovered Dun Huang and uh, when he discovered it in <coughs> the early part of 1907, he discovered there was a, um, a monk uh, a Taoist monk, actually, not a Buddhist, he was Taoist, Wang his name was, and Mr. Wang had taken it upon himself to stay in, the, uh, in, stay in um, <coughs> Don Huang and actually start restoring um, some of the places there. And he did that with his acolytes so that he could uh, pay for the restoration. Mark Orlstein did a deal with him and bought several things or piles of things from him. But what is significant is that they discovered, and Wang had only just discovered this, a sealed up cave. It's called Cave 17, which is actually here. So this is Cave 16 here with the requisite Buddha statue and um, attendants and beings. And this one was walled up. 
and they kind of opened it together because they could see there was a crack in something else behind. They call it the library cave. There were thousands of scrolls put and sealed up in here. Here are some of them, and they brought them out. Why seal them up? Dunhuang is a huge repository of Buddhist art, one of the biggest in the world, and one of the best preserved in spite of the looting and everything else. When the Tang Dynasty fell in 618 to 907, 10th century, they wanted to preserve the culture. So the monks got all the sutras and walled them up in a separate cave to preserve them. Nobody saw them for you know, nearly a thousand years until they got retrieved and Mark Orstein bought quite a substantial pile of them over two or three visits. They didn't know what they were buying because they didn't really read Chinese and they weren't conversant with Buddhism, but they got a huge number of very interesting scrolls, which then went back to London, the Archaeological Society, and were disseminated and have formed the basis of Silk Road studies in London ever since. So they've been absolutely wonderful to read and see. So these are some of the scales, scrolls from Cave 17 at Dunhuang. Um, and some of the images are quite extraordinary. This is a large hanging, as you can see, and is typical for the tribute um, to one of the many Buddhas and the peoples coming in here, and also the donors. Now, the donors were usually quite small people at the bottom of these uh, large scrolls so that they could uh, be noted. The reason for this is that as people passed through Dunhuang and stayed there, it was sort of obligatory to make a donation, like you make a donation to the church on Sundays. So they would make a donation and commission somebody, an artist, to make a scroll or a painting a wall painting or a Buddha. And this would be to give protection for them on their travels. And when they came back and returned and stayed at the same place, they would give thanks for their protection for their journey. And they would make another donation of a painting or a scroll or whatever. Which is why this is such a repository and one of the great repositories of art because of the way the pilgrims and the travellers made these types of donations in this place at that time for their own insurance, really. It was like a travel insurance, but what a wonderful way to do it. So those are the donors at the bottom. Now, this one is a Buddhist banner, and it's a bodhisattva, and here... She's, she or he, they could be either male or female, is holding a bowl here. This particular bowl actually is one of these. It's a glass bowl, um, which was extremely rare at the time and only came from Central Asia. Um, and glass was considered the most refined of things because it was transparent, because it was clear, and only very, very wealthy people had it, and it was used in Buddhist rituals for clarity, because it was clear. This beautiful goose reliquary uh, from Takshila, first century, uh, was used in rituals. It looks like a piece of Lalik, doesn't it? Perhaps Lalik got the idea from one of these wonderful pieces. These were highly rare pieces that were traded along the Silk Roads and ended up in all sorts of places. Looking quickly at the Buddha group, 8th century Sakyamuni, uh, silk hanging here. It's a silk hanging that's been folded up for centuries because the, the bits missing here are the two fold lines. You know, you take a piece of cloth and you fold it and then you roll it up. That's what's happened to this one. It's an embroidery. It's very beautiful. And the paintings all over the ceilings, paintings, stucco, 